Welcome back to the shed. This is my latest addition to the Wigwag engine family and this was inspired by a member of the Wigwag Facebook group who posted up a three cylinder inline version of the Wigwag engine which he had built from mahogany. And I just loved this concept that Mark had shared and I just had to make one of these triple inline Wigwags for my own collection. As with the other engines in my Wigwag family, I decided to build it from regular aluminium and brass bar stock rather than the mahogany that Mark had used, as I am not over familiar with working with such a strange and exotic material known as wood. Now this engine requires that all three columns and the axle bearings to be in precision alignment and dimensional accuracy with each other to allow the free running of the finished crank axle through the engine. So to achieve this, I glued the three pieces of the chassis stock together into a single block and then machined them together to get them square, before drilling and reaming out the holes for the axle and pivot bearings. I could then use ground dowel pins to make sure that the alignment was preserved whilst the other features of the chassis were machined together and ensuring the base of the columns were perfectly parallel with the axle shaft. Now I didn't shoot any footage of the machining of this engine as you have all seen this done before on the Wigwag build series but I did take a few photos during the process showing the stages of production. The holes for the journal pins on the crank discs also need to be in precise alignment with each other so the cranks were stacked together and mounted on a clamping jig for drilling and reaming. These could then again be pinned together with dowels for the milling operations to create the counterweighted crank shape. The other components of the engine, such as the pistons, cylinders and connecting parts, were all made and the components built up in readiness for final assembly of the engine. Now the triple engine, as its name suggests, consists simply of three single cylinder wigwags connected together and the majority of the parts were made to or based on the original wigwag drawings. The few changes made were to the inner crank discs where a simpler planar design was used with an extended journal pin to make the connection to the next engine crank assembly. The bearing bushes were also modified by extending them to suit the outer connecting crank disc which replaces the normal flywheel position. The engine cranks simply connect together with each other using the extended journal pin and a small grub screw in the outer crank allows the timing of the piston stroke to be set individually in relation to each other on each engine. The engine chassis are set onto a base plate using screws from the underside and all three can now be connected together using the crank journal pin to connect the individual axles into one continuous crankshaft. The sprung loaded pivot tensioner was modified from the original drawings to accommodate the reduced space between the engines, so a simple knurled ring was used instead of the regular tension nut.
The three air inlet ports of the engine were connected together with an air supply manifold which was made from 316 brass pipe, silver soldered together. One end of the small branch pipes was filed to form a concave radius to suit the main pipe and these were set in position with clamps and silver soldered together. Then a 1 8 of an inch drill bit was used to drill down through the pipes and into the main supply pipe to create the air passages. And finally a short length of 1 8 pipe was soldered to the end to allow connection to my air supply. Now I must say that I found this one of the most challenging parts of the engine build as my silver soldering skills leave a lot to be desired and it's also one of the reasons I have a half built boiler under the bench gathering dust. But the worst of my soldering was cleaned up with a file and after some time spent polishing it didn't look too bad and it was of course airtight which was the main objective after all. This was then temporarily fitted and the engine set up on some spacer blocks to clear the workbench and the air supply connected to turn the engine over. The base fixings were then gently readjusted to allow some lateral movement of the chassis columns to help them self align to the rotating axle and then tightened to set the position. A walnut base was then made with a recess and this was fixed to the engine base with two screws from the underside and then the flywheel fitted to line up with a flat filed on the shaft. Small oil cups were fitted to the bronze bearing bushes and all moving parts were then oiled up. I also add some oil to the air supply tube at regular intervals to ensure that the cylinders and port faces receive adequate lubrication when in use. The timing of the pistons was set at approximately 120 degrees to each other to create a balanced cycle and also ensuring that one of the pistons will always be on the power stroke at any given point of rotation, allowing the engine to be self-starting when air pressure is applied. As you can see the engine runs beautifully at both slow and faster speeds. 
and the triple chuff chuff sound from the exhaust reminds me that of an old tractor. Well, I hope you enjoyed this new addition to the Wigwag Engine Collection. And I'd also like to say a really big thanks to all the members of the Wigwag Facebook group for sharing their Wigwag Engine builds and ideas. And it is very heartwarming, as well as inspiring, to see the little Wigwag Engine reaching into so many workshops and sheds around the world, keeping so many people occupied and happy. If you fancy having a go at building this or any of my other wigwag engines, you'll find the drawings of the original wigwag in the description link below. Or you could follow the wigwag Facebook group for inspiration and ideas and exciting new builds from all the members. And as always, take good care and thanks for watching. <laughs>